Welcome to Nuke Radio. This is episode number 40. Today is Thursday, June 14th, 2012. And I'm having a few uh, computer problems here today. Jules and I aren't feeling well either. I don't know if it's the incoming CME. We had a big flare off the sun yesterday, which should be hitting today. If it hits later on, maybe we'll see some northern lights. Our good friend, Nibiru Magic, gave his daily climate change update, and we're going to play that where he covers some of the news stories that I wanted to talk about today. I'm going to start off tonight as a little shout-out to my fellow YouTubers and news channels out there. I know times are grim right now. There's a lot of things going on. Whew, keep shining that light. That's all we can do. Keep swinging. That's all we can do. Let's get started. Sop.net. Waters near Osaka Bay, Japan turn yellow. At this moment, people in Osaka and Kobe are tweeting the color of Osaka Bay looks strange. From the picture, it looks pale yellow. And from reports from local citizens, it's become strange color before the Great Hanshin earthquake in 1995 as well. Well, they might want to stay informed just in case. Unusual dolphin stranding on Texas coast prompt inquiry. The deaths of more than 120 dolphins in Texas coast have prompt, prompted a federal agency to declare the event unusual and launch an investigation into whether they were related to a drought, related algae bloom, or a more widespread mortality event that has plagued the northern Gulf of Mexico for two years. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. Uh, update, High Park con Fire Containment will come soon, but control is months away. Um... These are the fires up in Alaska. They're saying they're trying to get a break around the head, and they've got to strategically place their limited resources into fighting this fire. And all they got are they're, they're trying to pin down the monster at anchor at an anchor point, building a line flank in the best, and pinch off its head for total containment. Um, so they got a plan, but the winds have changed. Southern half of Western Australia braces for second cyclone, 125 kilometer an hour blasts of wind. And they've got videos out on that, of course. A rare tornado hit Venice um, on the 12th. Around 11 a.m. yesterday, a tornado hit Venice in Italy. Initial reports indicated that trees were damaged, market stalls overturned, and some buildings were damaged. No injuries have been reported, and they have a good video of that as well. Uh, China's Wuhan city covered in sudden, mysterious yellow haze. A thick yellow cloud covers a busy intersection in uh, Wuhan on June 11th. I was blanketed by a thick yellowish cloud on Monday, raising fears polluting among the 9 million inhabitants. Residents told AFP witness said the, the haze appeared suddenly in the morning and residents rushed to put on face masks. The government actually put on alerts, uh, people with breathing, old and young people stay inside kind of thing. Uh, there was also rumors about a major chemical uh, accident outside the city, but uh, of course there's no official reports on that either. But it's a mystery. And uh, uh, Afghans fear 80 dead after quake triggers landslide in that big high mountainous region. And of course, uh, we all know uh, Guatemala's volcano Fuego erupted again, second time this year. Over to the Watchers, uh, brewing tropical storm. Uh, Guchol, G-U-C-H-O-L, flooded southern Philippines. Uh, it is definitely on track right into that soupy mess uh, in the eastern Pacific. Or western Pacific, I guess. Yeah, out by Japan and stuff. And uh, Palisades Power Plant, one of the first worst nuclear power plants in the United States, has been shut down. I reported upon uh, on this one earlier. Uh, they found pin links in one of the cooling pools uh, they used to cool the reactors. Uh, basically, they uh, can't find or they found a bunch of leaks and they've got to shut it down, drain the tank, 
patch the holes, fill it back up, test it again, and see if they go. But uh, Palisades is one of the worst rated nuclear reactors in the United States. And that's about all I want to cover on there tonight. Let's just go ahead and go over to the nuclear stuff, e and &E News. TEPCO still unable to find where water is leaking out of reactor number two. No sign of melted fuel. Images fail to show a big gap in temperatures. Well, I wonder why. The fuel has gone through containment and into the ground and is now leaching out into the Pacific Ocean through the water table system. And uh, Japan has become a huge toxic nuclear tea bag seeping into the Pacific Ocean. And the ocean currents are doing what they do. And uh, we are paying for that. 300 times more radiation released into the atmosphere from burning debris than claimed by government. I've been going on about this since they announced they were going to do it. They're not using any special filters. They're using the regular um, soot filters on these incinerators that were not designed to handle uh, nuclear waste. And I've heard several reports where they're uh, running a lot higher than normal um, or allowable uh, nuclear um, burning. And uh, they're going ahead and burning it anyway. And people are wondering what all this mysterious black ash um, and stuff is spreading around Japan. The dust monitoring and fallout investigation are evidently fake, and we've known this for a while, TEPCO's been lying. Uh, they can't stop the truth that is leaking out of what is Fukushima. Local officials, so many people have sore, scratchy throats. I feel uneasy about the amount of airborne radioactive substances. You remember, we got high school kids over there right now today cleaning up in Fukushima Prefecture and uh, showing us signs of uh, recovery so they can come back here and spread all that love around. Uh, we've got a well-known Japanese actor leaving the country because of spent fuel pool number four at Fukushima and burning of debris. And uh, here you go. They got an analyst saying the cost of admitting the truth about Fukushima is so great that Japan won't admit it. Enough to make you question whether to live in Tokyo. Well, I can tell you, don't live in Tokyo. Get out of there. Get out of Japan. The Northern Hemisphere, but there's really nowhere to run anymore. Um, back when, 16 months ago, uh, the plutonium was, was put out in aerosol form. I was picked up by monitors in Europe uh, where they detected plutonium and aerosol form in the atmosphere. And uh, we have a radiation spike that goes around the globe every 40 days or so. It's just things to keep up with when you're looking at the big picture. Fukushima woman to officials, I started to suffer from various health problems one after another since last June, exactly the same as those found in the villages around Chernobyl. And, uh, yeah, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And it will go on and on and on and on and on. And uh, all we can do is shine some light on what's really going on out there. I encourage you, I encourage you. Get this out into the mainstream. The more videos we put out with silly titles and uh, news stories that we find about where they're lying and what's really going on, uh, the better off we will be. And I have no idea what we can do about this. None. So I'm going to continue to do what I do. I pray you continue to do what you do. Enjoy what you can. Laugh and smile every day and appreciate those little things. They really are worth it. Thanks. Great update from him. And, you know, whenever I share his um, his uh, climate forecast, it, it, it gets shared all over Facebook. People really like it. So I encourage you to share that through social media and think about what he said about putting out your own videos about Fukushima. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Nuked Radio.
And welcome back to Nuked Radio. That Osaka Bay story is a bit concerning. People who live around the area started tweeting yesterday that the color of the bay looks strange. There's a picture on the extinction protocol, which he read from. It shows a, um, a wide angle shot of the city and the bay, and you can see it looks yellow. Something else that was in the news a few days ago was, um, in fact, Ken brought this up on WTF on Monday, was the skies in uh, seven cities in China had a very thick yellow smog over them a few days ago. And I don't know if maybe some of that had settled into the bay. The concern is that in 1995, prior to a large earthquake in the region, the same thing happened. The water turned yellow right before the earthquake. And I dropped a research paper into chat from Northwestern University in Illinois about earthquake precursors. It's a fascinating paper. It not only does it cover the, um, the animal signs, like snakes leaving their burrows prior to the Kobe earthquake, um, Basically, the animals head for the hills right before it happens. And we talked about uh, Dr. Berkland, former worker from the USGS, some of the research that he's done actually searching the lost pet ads to try to determine uh, when an earthquake might happen because of animals running away. But the other concern, and this is touched about touched on it in this paper also, is the release of sulfur dioxide from faults and that's yellow and that could be changing the color of the water too. So the paper goes into detail about it if you wanna read up on it. The other thing that he mentioned was 300 times more radiation released into the atmosphere. That's 300 times, not 300%, 300 times more than what the Japanese government has been saying. And this stuff is getting trucked all over Japan and getting burned in incinerators. And according to him, they're only using regular soot filters. Now, could that be why there's this black substance being found all over Tokyo and other cities that's highly radioactive? Because a lot of these isotopes, they don't burn at a regular burn temperature, they, they burn much higher, the melting rate and so forth. You're, you're not getting rid of radioactive materials when you burn them. What you're doing is sending the particles back up into the air. There was another story that he mentioned, 120 dolphins dead in Texas. I hadn't heard about that before, had you, Jules? No, not in Texas. I hadn't. Um, there were a few major fish kills over the last few days, but uh, I hadn't seen the dolphins. Yeah, you know, there was a major fish kill uh, about 400 miles <clears throat> north of St. Louis two days before the South Bend, Indiana spike. And someone had posted that on Radchick. We have also in, in Chiba the sardines 10,000 sardines that are washing up. In fact, there's pictures of that where you see the beach, and that's not sand, that's dead fish. Yeah, I caught that. It was termed apocalyptic in Japan, and I mentioned in the last paper that I wrote for End the Lie when I posted that on Rad Chick, someone said, is this really apocalyptic? <laughs> and I said, if you're a sardine, it is. <laughs> It's, it's pretty bad. So I don't know what's going on in Texas. Um, and I don't have a link for that story. There was a report on any news from a Fukushima worker. Um, this guy has been supplying information to XSKF and to the guy who runs Fukushima Diary. His name is Happy11311. 
He's a Fukushima worker. And on June 13th, a tweet that he sent said that there is another camera filming now right next to reactor number four. And the workers have been watching it. It's on the upper part of the exhaust stack on the south side of the reactor building. And we've been looking at images from that camera. So I don't know if they can't get near the reactor right now. I haven't seen any um, images of people working around it. I've seen crane movement. But sometimes, even from the distant camera, you can see people working. Um, they have mentioned in the past that, that people want the camera moved that focuses on reactor one, where you have the other reactors in the, in the background, to switch that over so it points at reactor four, and you can see three and four better. But apparently they've done that. They're just not sharing it. In fact, um, supposedly they have quite a few cameras they haven't shared with us all over that site. Um, Christina? Yeah. I believe late last night I caught a story, too, about Reactor 1 and the uh, cover that they put over the top of it. Um I don't remember if it was that same worker, but it was somebody that was in the know had said that that cover over reactor one, you know, they told us that it was to keep the radiation down, but it really is just cosmetic. So we can't see what they're doing. Yeah. And ever since they put that up, Miss Milky, the clown has referred to it as the circus tent. <laughs> it's about it. I, what's going on inside. And there's been times, not recently, but. I want to say probably three or four months ago where you could see huge orange flashes going on inside of there at night mm -hmm. that were reflecting on the sides of the tent. I haven't seen that for a while, but I believe I have that video saved on my playlist and I'll look for it at the break. Locally, Palisades is having a problem. Um, this came out... Let's see, on June 13th, those who live near the Palisades nuclear power plant near Covert are responding to the news that the plant was closed to repair a water tank leak. Fox 17 talked to a woman who lives just half of a mile from the plant in a cottage on the beach. She says that she wishes the plant would give her some warning before it shuts down. It's a little disconcerting to all of a sudden hear a screech and see all this stuff coming out of the plant, says Margaret Roche. Palisades Park resident. She says when the plant shuts down, loud steam is released from the facility. It's loud. The steam is very loud. Last fall when they had that mishap there, it was, in fact, that was even reported on the NRC event notification when that happened because so many people called in. The plant was shut down to repair what plant officials are calling a small leak in the plant safety injection and refueling water tank. That water does contain tritium. Wow. According to Palisades Communications personnel, the large tank holds about 300,000 gallons of water. <clears throat> that is the source for flooding up the reactor cavity during refueling outages. It is also the source for the safety injection system to remove heat from the reactor's core for an extended time period due to the loss of coolant. Palisades Operations Department claims they have been monitoring, collecting, and analyzing tank leakage twice every 24 hours over the past several days. So I wonder what day this started. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Here's a scoop on Palisades. The Palisades Power Plant is a nuclear power plant located on Lake Michigan in Van Buren County's Covert Township, Michigan, on a site of 432 acres, five miles south of South Haven, which is a tourist spot. Palisades is owned and operated by Entergy. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission defines two emergency planning zones around nuclear power plants, a plume exposure pathway zone with a radius of 10 miles concerned primarily with exposure to and an inhalation of airborne radioactive contamination and an ingestion pathway zone of about 50 miles concerned primarily with ingestion of food and liquid contaminated 
by radioactivity. If you go to that resource that we've mentioned on here a few times, it's on CNN Money called How Close Do You Live to a Nuke Plant? You can put in your zip code or your city and it'll show you where all the closest plants are and you'll see there's a big, a small red circle around the plant and then a larger red circle. The small one is the 10 mile zone, the large one is the 50 mile zone. And of course, we all know now, especially from following Fukushima, that drawing a big circle around something and saying that that's where the cloud will be is completely wrong because that's not how the winds blow. So basically everything downwind in the state of Michigan would be affected, including my area, and I live on the opposite side of the state. What's interesting about this, though, is Palisades is about 40 miles north of South Bend. And the night that I called the NRC about the high numbers in South Bend, I asked them about Palisades because that's where the wind was coming from. The wind direction would have brought any air in that area directly to South Bend. And I hope you guys got a chance to watch the Potter blog video with the data that he analyzed. He said that it was a true event. And what happened at that time is the wind stopped over South Bend for a period of about four and a half hours. That coincides exactly with the time that these high measurements were taken. So I encourage you to watch that video if you haven't done so yet. Palisades has a history of problems that was shut down a few months ago, and it was shut down last year, I believe in April. This particular problem, they're going to just weld the tank if they can find the leak. So moving on, there was an article that came out over the weekend in Veterans Today, and Helen Caldicott, said that this was a wonderful article and encourages everybody to share it. It's called Fukushima Daiichi, From Nuclear Power Plant to Nuclear Weapon. It's by Anthony Hall. And he starts this article off with a quote from Einstein. Our world is faced with a crisis that has never before been envisioned in its whole existence. The unleashed power of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. He wrote that in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in May of 1946. Albert Einstein's warning and the ominous fate of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. As the bad news gradually spreads that the debacle at Fukushima Nuclear Power Plant 1 is becoming more perilous rather than less so, the words of Albert Einstein come to mind. Recall that the legendary physicist Einstein helped to set in motion the Manhattan Project whose personnel designed and built the first atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. In his letter to U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1939, Einstein warned that if the United States did not enter and win the race to harness the destructive potential of atomic weaponry, Germany would almost certainly do so. And that was part of the reason that Einstein was recruited for this project is because our government was worried that Hitler would develop a nuclear weapon first. The Manhattan Project became a primary prototype for the research and development partnerships linking the U.S. government and for-profit co corporations in what a Dwight D. Eisenhower would later describe as the military-industrial complex. Einstein and himself did not directly participate in this huge initiative aimed at defeating the Axis powers linking Japan with Germany and Italy. One of the 20th century's most iconographic thinkers watched from the sidelines as other physicists and technologists applied many of Einstein's theories to the building of atomic weaponry. After Japan lay in ruins, not only from the atomic destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also from the massive carpet bombing of Tokyo and several other urban centers, Einstein went public with his fears and anxieties. 
in famous passages that had become subject to various translations and paraphrasing, Einstein observed, our world is faced with a crisis that has never before been envisioned in its whole existence. The unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. There's been many previews of the catastrophe anticipated by Einstein in the period after 1945 and before the March 2011, the day an earthquake and tsunami set in motion a chain reaction of interconnected crises that ruined Japan's oldest operating nuclear power plant. The evidence grows every day that this local incident extends to national, regional, and global chain reactions that one way or another will end Japan as we have known it and will transform our world in ways that are difficult even to imagine at this early stage of the crisis. The direction and quality of this transformation depends very much on whether we can transform our way of thinking to adapt to the transformations brought about by our explorers of science and the innovators of technology that travel in their wake. By charting a course heading deep into inner space and tapping the volatile energy sources emanating from matter's molecular constitution, our civilization has been altered in ways that put us face to face with Einstein's prophecy. This is really an excellent article, very well written. There's some diagrams of nuclear power plants in Japan. There's 55 of them. They're all located on the coast. And as you know, Japan is surrounded by multiple faults. The article goes on to say the Fukushima debacle is only in its infancy. The growing realization that the worst of the Fukushima debacle lies in the future rather than in the past puts in sharp relief the pertinence of Einstein's observation. Indeed, the prophetic nature of his warning is starkly reflected in the failure of so many in government, in the media, in the academy, and especially in the richly funded inner sanctums of the nuke industry to respond appropriately to the terrifying implications of what has gone so terribly wrong at Japan's spewing Fukushima number one power plant. A major obstacle blocking proper perception of the Fukushima debacle's true nature has its origins in a propaganda mime going back to the 1950s. Initiated by U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower with his Atoms for Peace speech at the United Nations in late 53, this propaganda meme seeks to disassociate entirely the dual compartments within the nuclear industry. So this article lays it all out. I um, encourage you guys to read the entire thing and share it. Talks about radioactivity as a slow but sure weapon of mass destruction. The science of measuring and understanding the effects of radioactivity on biological transformations is still in its infancy. Nevertheless, since 1945, the tendency has been for promoters of applied nuclear power to deny, negate, or downplay the effects of radioactivity on life's natural patterns of renewal. This culture of denial has its origins in the official response of U.S. government officials to the radioactive contamination of all people plants, and animals that survived the first wave of destruction from the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This unwillingness to contend with the effects of radioactivity on the public health of a large population group was captured in a headline in the New York Times on September 13, 1945. That headline proclaimed, No Radioactivity in Hiroshima Ruins. You're listening to Nuked Radio. We'll be back in just a moment. You should learn how to say no. And welcome back to Nuked Radio. Switching gears, we need to talk about Canada for a moment. I know I said that we were going to do an alternative energy discussion today, but there's just too much news to cover. We're going to have to save that for a day when there's a little less going on. 
I want to thank um, Jules for being here, too, because I didn't announce, announce them at the beginning of the show, and Kurt from Room 101 for playing clips for us. Something rather strange that happened in the last week was Canada had a mass firing of ocean scientists. This was published in the Environmental Health News Division of the Environmental Health Sciences. Um, the editor's note on this article is about the dismantling of the, of the nation's entire ocean contaminants program as part of a massive layoff of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. I mean, could they pick a worse time to do this? Among the scientists terminated are ones who have conducted landmark research about global pollutants for decades. Peter Ross, who is among the world's leading experts on marine mammals and contaminants. Gary Stern, a mercury expert whose work focuses on the Arctic. Michael LaBeouf, who studies the highly contaminated St. Lawrence belugas. And Michael Economo, who, research flame, who researched flame retardants and other endocrine disrupting contaminants in salmon and other ocean life. Ross told EHN that his main concern is the wholesale axing of pollution research that will leave Canada and much of the world without the scientific knowledge to protect whales, seals, fish, and other marine life. I mean, we have a debris field coming. We have a radioactive slick that will be coming as well. They're testing radiation in the fish. In fact, Canada was one of the first places that found it in fish shortly after the Fukushima disaster, but they never disclosed where the fish were caught. And they shut down all their monitors. And I get emails from Canadians all the time that don't know where to go for information. Thank goodness we have people like the group Radiation Watch, <clears throat> Radiation Health Solutions on Facebook, CAN Coalition Against Nukes, Fukushima 311, and I know it gets discouraging at times because the news is bad, but we're waking people up. We're working together. I'm really proud of how everybody pulled together last week with the South Bend incident, trying to get information. And you have to remember, you think we have it bad. It's nothing compared to the people in Japan. But Peter Ross, this head scientist, wrote an article in light of his termination since being hired 13 years ago as a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, I have been fortunate to conduct research on such magnificent, magnificent creatures as killer whales, beluga whales, harbor seals, and sea otters. I have visited some of the wildest parts of coastal BC, Arctic Canada, and further afield. I have been humbled by the power of Mother Nature as we deployed teams to explore and better understand the lives of creatures beneath the surface of the ocean. <clears throat> I have marveled at the evolutionary adaptions of marine mammals to an existence at the interface of land, sea, and atmosphere. And as a scientist, I have come to learn that I possess but rudimentary powers of observation when it comes to the mystery and beauty of a vast ocean. For all of this, I remain eternally grateful. I am thankful for the rich array of opportunities aboard Canadian Coast Guard ships and small craft alongside fishery officers, chemists, habitat biologists and managers together with colleagues, technicians, students, and members of Aboriginal communities. I've enjoyed weaving stories of wonder on such issues as the health of killer whales, effects of flame retardants on beluga whales, hydrocarbons in sea otter habitat, trends in priority pollutants in harbor seals, impacts of current use of pesticides on the health of salmon, the identification of emerging contaminants in endangered species and risk benefit evaluation of traditional f seafoods of First Nation and Inuit peoples. Now, this is the head guy that they fired. It is with deep regret that I relay news of my termination of employment at Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the loss of my dream job. It is with even greater sadness that I learn of the demise of DFO's entire contaminants research program regionally and nationally. It is with apprehension that I ponder a Canada without any research or monitoring capacity for pollution in our three oceans or any ability to manage its impacts on commercial fish stocks, 
traditional foods for over 300,000 Aboriginal people and marine wildlife. Canada's silence on these issues will be deafening this summer and beyond. I am thankful to my friends, family, supporters, and colleagues who have always been there to converse, share, learn, and teach in the lab, in the field, in the cafeteria, in the hallway. These people have made it all worthwhile. So Canada, just shut it down. We're probably next. I wonder if someone was getting ready to blow the whistle on something there. Something happened. I mean, it's... The fact that they've done that should be a rude wake-up call to the entire North America. I mean, they don't want it to get out. They see the tsunami debris coming. They see how bad things are, and they see people are waking up. So, you know, shut them down so there's no real scientific data coming out. That'll be wonder, the only way. Yeah, I wonder how many people were axed totally. I mean, this was across the whole. It's not just yeah. D.C. No, it's the whole not country. It's the whole country, their whole ocean contaminants program. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Very concerning. And they um, said it was budget cuts. <laughs> wow. NOAA, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, just started a new page on tracking marine debris from the Japanese tsunami. Ongoing efforts to update and refine computer models with wind speed and ocean current data is leading to a better understanding of how fast tsunami-generated debris may travel across the Pacific. They have a program. Um, they have the latest information, modeling maps. What they found so far, I know there was a guy that started doing this, and the goal of his web page is actually to... Um, reunite mementos of importance with people in Japan. And we talked about him in the past, and I don't recall what the name is of his website, but I will find it for next Tuesday. So Noah's got a page up now. There's podcasts on here. And also um, field surveys where people put in what they found so far a couple other interviews that I came across in the past couple of days that I don't want to hang on to until next week to share with you guys. One of them is Dr. Bill Deagle being interviewed on rents. This got posted last night. You can find it on YouTube. I believe Miss Milky uploaded it. And Dr. Deagle talks about the physicians... In fact, there's a, a physician who is retired from the academy who's been following Fukushima and trying to get other doctors on board. There are a few dozen doctors across the United States that have started doing heavy metal testing on their patients. And what they're finding is thorium in every single patient they've tested. That's not coming from nature. That came from a nuclear reactor. There's other isotopes being found, cesium, for one. Um, he talks about that extensively, the breakdown of things being found, and also how that ties into the economy and why Fukushima has been allowed to continue. In his opinion, it's a big distraction, where it will be a big distraction when things hit the fan with the economy which it looks like may be happening soon. Greece has some elections coming up this weekend. People are pulling their money out of banks. They've been uh, limited on their withdrawals. You used to be able to take out 2,000 at a time. Now you can only take out 200. And Charlie McGrath volunteered to come on here and talk about that stuff with us. If you guys have an interest in that, I will have him on. He is... Um, He's an expert in the economy and all things financial, and it's interesting to see what this possible relation could be to Fukushima. Another video <clears throat> put out by Chris Busby on nuclear storage, where he talks about this program where scientists have been studying for the last 20 years 
and a long-term storage facility underwater in the Baltic Sea. They had plans to drill holes in bedrock and insert spent fuel rods. <clears throat> he did some calculations and found out that those spent fuel rods would release hydrogen and eventually explode. So he's nixed the whole program with this video. After 20 years of research paying these people to study this, they apparently missed that. Thank goodness for people like Chris Busby. So check out those interviews. We'll bet be back on Tuesday. Keep sharing, share caring, and concern for your fellow man, and stay safe.